And now for the main person who's comfortably sitting with amongst you all, um, Eddie Conway. Uh, the theme for this month is broken. And um, it's so funny where it kind of aligns usually uh, month by month with HQ because um, they seem to be on the same, um, have the same perspective as us with these themes. And this month with Broken, um, there's no way um, I could think of anything else but like the climate of our city and where we're at and how our creative community um, interacts with other industries in, in the city to help fix Baltimore, help fix whatever is broken um, in the city, um, help have these uh, difficult, cha challenging, maybe uncomfortable um, conversations um, in the city. And the um, first person I thought of was Eddie Conway, uh, Marshall Eddie Conway. Um, so a little about him. Um, he's a published author, organizer, educator, and former minister of defense of the Baltimore chapter of the Black Panther Party. Um, he's also one of the longest incarcerated prisoners in the United States. Um, he was incarcerated for um, nearly uh, 40 years. Uh, that's a long time. And um, in that, he has um, never stopped working for a city. Um, he continuously um, creates programs, creates accessibility, creates opportunities for um, youth, uh, those who are in need of those opportunities, um, places that are not as developed in this developed in the city, including us Baltimore, um, and that includes a project that he's been working on um, called the Tubman House. Um, He'll be up here talking um, a little bit more about that and a little bit more about his experience um, that definitely falls along the um, lines of this month's theme, Broken. So, what? Huh? I'm oh, sorry. My hair? Okay. <laughs> They're telling me stuff. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> If there's something wrong, tell me. Uh, so, um, yes, yeah. so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Eddie Conway. So, good morning. Um, I'd like to just start from where I got started from. I uh, was in Europe on the way to Vietnam in 1967 when a series of reports came over the news uh, and newspapers were reporting that there were rides in the United States of America uh, there was turmoil in the communities and I was concerned at that time that something in America was broken and so that's, that's what I started looking at. And I was on my way to Vietnam to make the world safe for democracy. And I decided to get out of the army and come home and find out what was wrong in America with democracy. That led me into research and the research led me back to ancient Athens in Greece and I looked at their system of democracy which this is designed on and I realized that of almost 300,000 citizens of Athens only 35,000 white men had the right to vote uh, a hundred thousand women had no vote. A hundred thousand plus slaves had no vote. And it made me understand that, well, okay, democracy is not broken. That's how it works. You have privilege, you have money, you have friends, it works for you. If you're a person of color, if you're in slavery, if you have no friends, and maybe something to change this year with the election, but if you're women, you have no equal rights. And so I had to move away from the fact that I thought, okay, this was broken. It's not broken, it's working. 
So I joined the Black Panther Party because I figured I needed to help change and put something else in place that would work a little better for us down here on the ground. Of course, the government decided that that wasn't going to happen. I end up in the prison system, and while in the prison system, the exposure of COINTELPRO, that's the counterintelligence program of the government, came out. And what we found out was they had manipulated our image, they had used the news, they had created a image for America that made us look like we were angry black militants with weapons and that we hated white people even though we had a white panther party even though we worked with the latino community even though we had a Rican association even though we had uh, associations and uh, alliances with the anti-war movement with uh, the american indian movement and so on they made us through the media through controlling the media look like we were angry black militants. So I went to jail in 1970. And when I went to jail in 1970, we thought, across America that is, that there were serious problems in the community. But what I didn't realize is that it was just the beginning of what would become serious problems. When I left, Bethlehem Steel was here. People were working in the community. When I left, there was no place you could go. Maybe, I mean, maybe there was an exception. I'm not saying that there was no place you could go, but you could not drive down the regular street, look in the second floor window of a house and see the sky. You couldn't see houses collapsing all around you. You didn't see communities collapsing all around you. You did not see people, and, and there was unemployment, and of course it was, it, it was uh, more unemployment in the black community than in all the other communities, but there was serious employment, uh, Bethlehem Steel, Fisher Body, Domino Sugar, Black and Decker, people had jobs. People had jobs and it made the community work. So I'm looking at that even as we went into the prison system and start working with prisoners and as prisoners came in, pouring into the prison system, it exploded from 700,000 prisoners when I got locked up to what today is presently 2.3 million prisoners uh, with 12 million people connected to the prison system some kind of way, on parole, probation, on the box, et cetera. Uh, so that's, that's almost nearly 15 million people here in America under the control of the prison system. So I said, well, okay, these correctional officers, which at the time we called guards, which whenever we got angry, we called pigs, these correctional officers can't be doing their job. Something is broken with the system. That's what I said. I said, something must be wrong with this system for it to continue to grow and grow and grow rather than to shrink and disappear. Because if the correctional officers are doing their job, why is this getting worse? Something, again, is wrong with the system. It's broken. That's what I said. That's what we were trying to figure out. And then we realized that the guards were getting paid according to the amount of people that was in the prison system. In other words, if you were a sergeant and there was 100 people in your prison, you would be a sergeant. But if you put 200 pre prisoners in there, you would become a lieutenant. If it was 300 prisoners in there, you would end up becoming a captain. So obviously, it's not in the correctional officer's interest to rehabilitate people, send them out in the community, and have them remain out there. Because the more people come back, the more people uh, 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 join the system, 
the more rank they make, the more wealth they gain, the more uh, status, the more power, etc., they get. So it wasn't that the prison system was broken. It was doing exactly what it was supposed to do. And it was, it was being incentivized by us because we were under the illusion, and we still are under the illusion, that we need to be protected from each other in such a way where we didn't care who was taken off the street because we had a sense of fear. Where did that fear come from? It came from the media. And so while in prison, I'm watching the media, we're having political education classes, we are looking at what's going on out in the community because we are not out there. And it's not jiving with what the prisoners that are coming in are telling us about what's going on out there. And we can't figure that out. Eventually, we started reaching beyond America and looking at television Al Jazeera, looking at BBC, looking at RT, looking at Chinese TV, looking at Telesaur. We start looking at other reports from around the world and we learned more about what was going on in America than we were learning by looking at NBC, uh, uh, CBS, ABC, or all the rest of those main media outlets were not telling us anything except who got shot, who got locked up, whose car was jacked, etc. And every once in a while we would get a little bit of positive news, but we never got the news about what was going on in America. But if we looked outside America, they were more than happy to report about the fracking, or more than happy to report about the, the protests, more than happy to report about the worker strikes, more than happy to report about people organizing in various communities, about the hunger strikes in the prison system. News that we could not find. And that's what controls how we view what's going on. So, and that fear, that fear allowed them to build an enormous prison industrial complex. And off the top, to be quite honest, it was like, well, why are all these people participating in it? You know, and I, and I think it's funny because I know for a fact that people are railroaded all the time through the system. But why are these people being caught up? And it came to our attention that these people are being caught up because Bethlehem Steel is closed. And I'm just talking locally now. Because Fisher Body has automated from 5,000 workers to 500 workers. Because Domino Sugar has decreased. Because Black & Decker went to China or somewhere. There were no jobs. And in lieu of the jobs, there was drugs put in the community as a means of paying the rent, buying food, taking care of the children. And those drugs created low intensity warfare in the communities, fights over territory, fights over protecting this and that. And, and what we didn't realize was that the money was going up the chain. It wasn't staying in the community. It was going outside of the community and banks and people that we don't even identify, people that's not even uh, targeted, we're getting rich off of the community. And in seeing that, and seeing how people were coming in, and seeing how this was set up, we said, well, okay, we need to do something. We need to come back to the community. We need to see if we can organize something better because once again, it looked like in terms of a community, especially down on the ground, it looked like the community was broken. 
the houses were falling down, there was no jobs, people were going to jail, uh, people were acting violently toward each other, neighbors weren't speaking, children were running around in the community with that thousand yard stare, or what they call, what the military call post-traumatic stress syndrome. You could look in the eyes of babies, and I'm talking five, six, seven, eight years old, and see they're terrified in their community. They see the police coming down the street and they break for the house because they remember that their uncle got locked up, or their aunt got beat up, or their big brother was attacked. And they're growing up in combat situations. And of course, me, other prisoners, outside organizations, friend of a friend, which I'm part of, uh, decided to go and see if we could just change one little community, change one little reality for people, give young people and give other people an option, some other options, another way to go, another way to see this, and another way to deal with it by organizing among ourselves and empowering ourselves. And this, this is important. When I did 44 years, incidentally, okay. Uh, well, it was 43, 11 months and days, but when I came home, my intention was enough. I had given at the office. I'm not doing any more of this. I was like 68, I'm 70 now. I, okay, let me just kind of like chill, live out my days, relax, go to the beach, driving up and down the streets of West Baltimore in particular, where I live at, uh, it scared me. It, and and, and, and I, I kind of draw this analogy. It's like Rip Van Winkle going to sleep and waking up 40 some years later and instead of society being better, instead of the community advancing, instead of their, their wealth, happiness, uh, all the rest of that stuff, there was decay. It was like going back 50 years. The community had actually decayed. It looked like a war zone in some areas. Uh, and you can go and, oh, you know that, you all know that. You know what the community looked like. It looked like a war zone. It looked like the war zones that we seen while we were over in Germany. And I couldn't figure out how could society go back? How could this be a third world country? How could this be with the wealth, the wealth of the empire? How could this place be decaying? How could billions of dollars be spent on the inner harbor and one two miles away, houses collapsing all around the inner harbor. People are living in those houses and rats and roaches and everything are jumping from house to house. How could that be? What was wrong? Something was broken. That's what I said. Something is broken, we're gonna try to fix it. But the reality is, and we got a dose of it with the subprime mortgage collapse, in 08, the reality is nothing's really broken. Rich people are getting rich, poor people are getting poor. The arrangement is working perfectly. Nothing's broken, people are getting wealthy. A very small percentage of people are getting wealthy and, uh, and they're getting wealthy on our backs and on our dimes and from our labor and we are getting poor. And we have to fight, maybe not some of y'all, some of everybody here looks like they're professionals or whatnot, but we have to fight for $15 an hour for 2020, when it's gonna cost us $25 an hour to live in 2020. You know, so they got us chasing, like a, hamper, a hamster, got us chasing the ball and we can never catch up. And we get poor and poor and poor. And so we looked at that and we said, 
Well, we need to draw the line in the sand somewhere. So we decided that we would work in Gilmore Homes and we would try to help stand that community up just one block at a time and help them deal with what was going on. In this case, it's three or four blocks, but it's the same thing. And, and then the governor came out with the gentrification program and it said $700 million to destroy, to take down, to knock down all of those houses, to, to, to create green space. And we looked around and we said, well, okay, how does that benefit the community if you're erasing block after block after block and you're sending people out and you're sending people in the county and you're sending people to other places where they are disjointed and disconnected and the community now is gone. And then you're somewhere where you don't know what's going on and you don't know your neighbor and you, you don't have that history that I had. I grew up, three generations of my families grew up in the same area, in the same neighborhood. I knew everybody. And I, well, most of them are dead now, but I knew them for like 50 years. You know, that would have been gone. So we looked around and decided that we would take a stand because what was happening was gentrification. This 700, uh, uh, will you keep time for me? Because I'm out of control, right? Okay, <laughs> this, this $700 million was just going to wipe our neighborhoods out. It was going to erase us and erase the unity of the community. And so, of course, you know, it looked like, okay, they wipe out this stuff and then they put in trees or flowers and five years later they sell that land to developers and somebody gets rich and our communities are gone. So we decided, okay, we could save the houses. We could save some of the houses. So we picked the Tubman house down in front of Gilmore Homes. And we decided to turn that into a community center. And we decided to work with the community, the young people, the street organizations, et cetera, down the, in that area, because we wanted to say, just one little example, that we can save our own community. We can save ourselves. We can create our employment. We don't have to, we don't have to bow to the things that's happening because they are happening to us without any input from us. But right after that, on the heels of that, there was a $500 million TIF grant to Under Armour, to other people, to continue the gentrification, they call it Port Coverton. It's a 30 year deal that we are gonna pay for. 30 years before they have to pay any taxes. 30 years before we get anything. And we look back, when you look back in the, the, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, we have done this time and time again and no one in the city has benefited from it. Big real estate developers are gaining money from this. And anytime, like the hotel, Hilton Hotel or whatever damn thing, anytime there's a loss, the taxpayers take the loss. We put out the bonds, we pay for the bonds, the developers get it. And in, in, in Port Covington, say for instance, if the whole thing goes broke, we pay the bill. There's no cost to them whatsoever and they don't have to start paying until 30 years from now. Something's wrong with that when you walk from Port Covington to Cherry Hill, maybe a mile, the community is in dire straits. 50% of the people unemployed. I, it, it's just hard for me to kind of like wrap my head around it. So what's, what's happening here? So what's happening here 
is the media is selling us some sort of imagery about how well the city is doing and how well it's going to develop and all of this stuff. But the reality is all around all of that stuff, the city is collapsing on us. We are not getting the news. And that's this is my last point because I'm running out of time. And so what, what I want to do is say this. There is obviously alternative press. And that alternative press is the real news. And we need to start watching what's really happening. And we need to start engaging and interacting with each other and see if we can't turn some of this around. The thing that you could see when you watch the real news and when you watch alternative news is that there's a lot of stuff going on in America. There's a lot of people engaged, but we don't know it because we are in something that young people call silos now. We're here, we're there, we're doing this, we only focus there. But there's a, across America, a vast network of people actually working down on the ground. Thousands, thousands of different little groups working. We need to plug into that. And so I'm suggesting that everybody here sign up for the real news, get on the internet, find out what we're, what we're looking at, find out what's going on in America, find out what's going on in the world, so that what we can do is we can fix these things that's not broken. Because they're not broken, it's all working. But it's not working in our interest. And the only thing that's broken is the information we're getting the international media, that is what's broken. We're not getting what's going on. And that's what we need to do because if we get that news, if we get that information, then we can take action and we can do something about it. Now, I know I done ran out of time, right? So I'm good for questions or whatever.